All right, so let's get started then. Um, so uh, I mentioned, I thought I'd updated, um, oh, actually, let me switch to a slightly different version of this presentation that has a couple of extra notes in it. Sorry about that. All right, let's try that again, that instead. Okay, so a couple of announcements. So um, originally when I had the schedule in mind for uh, this week and last week, I had forgotten that uh, Wednesday was Veterans Day. And so um, because um, Wednesday is uh, Veterans Day, then there is technically no lab this week, which is why I was able to extend the lab nine due date through this week. Now lab 10 is still out there and lab 10 is still available, but lab 10 won't be due this week, it'll be due uh, next week. Um, so that ends up kind of, you know, if you're going strictly by the lab schedule, that gets rid of some of the kind of like open time that you had. But if you're, um, you know, but right now I think people have been working asynchronously on the labs anyway, so probably doesn't practically change anything, but that's the reason why there was a shift in that due date. So lab nine got the extra week because there was a Veterans Day this week. It just happened to land on a Wednesday and that happens to be the day of the lab and then lab 10 next week. And so lab nine, as you, you know, basically is an, an introduction to the output analyzer and different ways you can work with terminating and these non-terminating systems or specifically transient simulations and steady state simulations in ARENA. So that was uh, meant to kind of go in part, or, you know, connect with what we've been talking about in class. Um, and then in lab 10, we get a little bit more advanced. And so you'll be introduced to sequences and uh, batching which are these, um, which are going to, uh, you know, batching is going to allow you to do things like in the muffin sim simulation, be able to create batch into these and then break them apart. And then sequences is going to allow you to um, much more simply uh, generate, if you've got different components, let's say of an assembly line, um, it allows you to mix and match them in much more kind of programmatic ways. So rather than having to kind of force you to wire them together, then it allows you to create kind of different recipes of those subcomponents to put together. So it ends up being a useful way to do that. And then what links into what we've been talking about the lectures a little bit um, is you'll also be introduced to simulation optimization or SimOpt. Um, and so there is a um, OptQuest tool that I think is introduced in lab 10, which is pretty cool, um, as well as the uh, process analyzer, which um, both of those might be useful to you not only in lab 10, but in the last homework. So the other thing I want to point out with um, lab 10 is that there is significant bonus credit. And so um, in lab 10, the um, there's 50 points possible, even though it's graded out of 30. And so the idea here is that if you're looking to make up some lab credit, then this is a way to do that. So, um, so don't overlook that. So basically it's like two labs in one. So there's the first half of the lab is on sequences and batching. And the second half of the lab, um, I think, or maybe the first half of the lab is on sequences and the second half of the lab is on batching. And if you just want to turn in the sequences part, that's fine. You'll get graded kind of out of the, the 30. But if you want to get the, you know, uh, try to shoot for the whole 50, then you can do the whole lab. So that's another reason why it's nice to have a little bit extra time to do the lab 10. And so I guess that's what I'm saying here. Part one is sequences and part two is batching, signaling, and holding. And by the way, I, even if you're not planning on doing part two, I highly suggest looking at this section on signaling and holding. There's a lot of really cool things you can do once you realize that you can signal and hold. So if you've got entities that you want to prevent them from even entering certain parts of your simulation and have them queue up in kind of a temporary queue and sort of until certain conditions are met, this is where you learn how to do that. And so right now we've just been queuing up if a resource is busy. But you might also, let's say imagine in a bank, for example, um, let's say you, um, you, you can't allow more than a certain number of people in the bank. Well, then you might need a queue outside of the bank and then, or you might just need those people to bulk. And so you can create kind of a temporary queue outside of the bank that is only turned on 
when the length of the queue inside of the bank reaches a particular limit. And whenever that length goes less than that limit, then the kind of the temporary queue outside releases and starts um, presenting entities back into the bank. So those are sorts of things that you can do once you learn how to use signaling and holding. And then also process analyzer and opquest, which I mentioned are gonna be useful in an upcoming homework too. So uh, that's uh, the lab stuff. Um, final project, uh, kind of know all of this stuff. Um, I thought I would have the input modeling report feedback all done by today, but then something came up. I have uh, gone through a good chunk of them. The biggest feedback that I have that I'm seeing, um, I mean, most of the, the reports I've, I've read have been pretty good. Occasionally, I've seen people confusing uh, outputs for inputs. And so people will do things like trying to do an input model for waiting times. Waiting times are should not have an input model. Waiting times you should collect data on. But that's for you to do to compare your simulation model to reality. So you can validate whether your simulation model is a good proxy for reality, but you don't actually fit a model to them because those waiting times emerge out of the simulation. What you do fit a model to are the service times, all of the activities. So um, if somebody comes up to a cashier, the instant they hit you know, uh, the, the cashier station, the time they spend at the cashier, that is like an activity time. So um, the time it takes for a food item to be prepared once the preparation has started that is an activity time. So the anything that's sort of waiting time, so um, if you've got a burrito that's uh, sitting waiting for other burritos to get finished before it gets started, that doesn't count towards its service time. If you've got a customer waiting in line who hasn't actually gotten to give her their order and they're in line, that doesn't count as part of their ordering time. And, uh, and so you should still take data on those waiting times, but that's for later to validate your simulation. On the input side of things, you're only focused on those activities. And that's kind of some persistent or some feedback that I've given to a couple of groups so far. Um, the other uh, feedback that I've given to a couple of groups so far is, is um, I think a lot of groups have picked a great system and there's a lot of potential there. Just make sure you're trying to answer a research question, an operations research question that isn't kind of obvious um, like, you know, you, you don't want to say, um, you know, will the performance of my system increase if <clears throat> I add another server? Um, well, I mean, we kind of know that it should increase. There, there might be a question of how much, but then it, you'll, you'll have to, in, in order to answer the how much it'll increase question, you'll have to build a simulation that you validated being highly accurate and you know matches in absolute quantities exactly what you got in the real system or else the how much in your simulated system won't mean anything in a real system so how much type questions usually um, aren't great for this type of project um, because they're just they're, they're much more difficult to defend um, the types of questions you're really interested in are more relative questions like did i get an improvement when i made this significant change so um, so that's so you're looking for questions that we can't easily answer with just a queuing model like from 470 and you're looking for questions that we can't sort of just reason through just kind of just mentally and sort of get an obvious answer so you're looking for things that are really you really don't know the answer to so will this type of assembly line process um, be better than this other type of assembly line process well those are two complex systems you know, and it's hard to say which one's better. That would be a great thing to simulate. So I'm gonna simulate under this condition, I'm gonna simulate under this condition and see um, which one comes out with better performance. That would be you know, a good example of something that would be great under simulation. So try to come up with those types of questions where the answer isn't kind of obvious ahead of time. And the answer isn't something that if it isn't obvious, you could get with a couple of back of the envelope uh, calculations from 470. So something that you really need to build the solution and run it to, in order to get an evaluation of how good the solution is. That's what you're looking for. Okay. Um, otherwise, um, there's ICAL is out uh, and uh, there will then be an ICA coming up as a final exam review. This is similar to the midterm final exam review where it just randomizes questions from the previous ICAs and you can, and it's, so it's more points than most of the ICAs, but you can take it as many times as you want. 
And then after the final exam review, which I think is the Tuesday um, of the last week of classes, then uh, it gets replaced with a practice one that you don't get any credit for, but you can keep taking as much as you'd like. Uh, there are sample final exams available on Canvas. In order to get access to them, you may have to take that um, final exam uh, lockdown browser compliance, similar to the midterm one, lockdown browser compliance. But once you take that real simple example to, to confirm that you still have the ability to use lockdown browser, then that should open up the final exam module and you can find sample final exams there to help you study for that. The last homework, uh, homework J2 has been posted. This is um, based on the um, inventory, the Bucky model, the inventory management model that we've seen before, you make some modifications to it. And then I ask you to optimize certain decision variables and the process analyzer or OptQuest would be great for that, or you can do it by hand. So this is an opportunity to learn, to use what you learned from lab 10 about the process analyzer or OptQuest. But if you don't wanna do that, you can also do the optimization by hand. Uh, there's no not going to be a solution set for homework J2 because the solutions are kind of subjective anyway, and we have used this to capture some ABET metrics before as well. All right, so uh, any questions that I can field? Okay. Um, I. Uh, before I, I said an announcement about this, um, I understand that the uh, Mac OS is going to have a big update that they're going to be announcing, I think, today, and they're expecting that that software update to be available soon. ASU is telling us to tell our students to not install that update until the end of the semester, because installing that update may break <clears throat> tools like Respondus Lockdown Browser and RP Now. Now, by the end of this week, they might know that both of those tools are going to work with the full release version of that software. And so maybe the end of semester is, um, is, is a conservative estimate, but they're at least telling us right now to inform students that if they want to make sure that the proctoring software continues to work, then you might hold off on installing that. So I just wanted to put that out there. Okay. All right, so um, we left off last time, uh, and uh, you know, so last time we introduced these uh, interval estimates and things like confidence intervals and standard error of the mean. And so basically the takeaway points that I um, want you to get out of this is that you, want to, you pretty much never want to give a point estimate. And um, because a point estimate if you just gathered a different set of data from the same system, you'll get a different point estimate. And so the point estimate, you know, the sample mean, it can vary. And so because of that, whenever you give someone a point estimate, you need to give them a range, which tells them how confident you are that if you were to take the point estimate again, it would be close to that existing point estimate. So if the data you're sampling from are independent and identically distributed, then in that case, an interval that you can always use is the standard error of the mean as the half width here. And so you can take your point estimate for say the mean, and then you can take the estimated standard deviation and divide it by square root of n. And then that gives you one interval estimate. You have to tell them what the intervals are. You can say, and this is plus or minus one uh, you know, standard error of the mean. You have to make sure you say standard error of the mean, um, not standard deviation, because they're different. And, um, and this gives you an estimate of sort of the width of the distribution of all of the different sample means you could have gotten if you ran the experiment again. So that's the first thing you can do. Now, if you happen to have data that you are confident are normally distributed and independent and identically distributed, but are normally distributed, then we introduce the confidence interval. And the confidence interval is this interval down here where the half width formula is this kind of ugly thing where you've got this critical T statistic, which scales the standard error of the mean. So notice the big difference between the confidence interval half width and the standard error of the mean is that we're just scaling the standard error of the mean by this uh, critical T statistic value down here. And so this confidence interval here, we'll see in a second, will be a more useful estimator. And that, well, I'll go into exactly why it's useful. Now, one of the things that it does is it also captures elements of the whole distribution so that you can actually, if, if you give someone a 95% uh, confidence interval, what you're implicitly telling them is that the data are normally distributed and you can unpack the confidence interval to get the mean out, 
which is you know, going to be right in the middle of the confidence interval. And you can also unpack it if you were to subtract out the half widths, then you can divide out, if you know the number of samples, the t value, and you get out the number of samples here, and then you can get out the standard deviation. So because you know it's a normally distributed uh, data, and you know the sample mean, and you know the sample standard deviation, then you can actually estimate the whole distribution for that data. So it's a nice, compact, and concise way to tell someone that you think your data are normally distributed, and here's the mean, and here's the standard deviation for that data. Now, if, um, if your data are not independent and identically distributed, then, then just in general, interval estimates are not to be trusted. Because you, um, if what I mean by not independent is if one sample predicts the next sample and predicts the next sample and so on and so forth, then studying the variation in all of those samples may end up giving you um, an, an underestimate, sort of a low estimate of what the actual variance is in the system. And so um, you have to be careful that these, um, these constructs that make use of the standard error of the mean are only used if you have independent samples. If you don't have independent samples, you don't actually have replication, you have pseudo replication, and you might have to use some other metric. And so you may actually have to re replace a bunch of um, a bunch of non independent data with a single point. And that's what we've done in um, as we talk about, say, the transient simulations for our transient simulations, we often take an average over the entire simulation. And we treat that as a single point for the simulation because inside the transit simulations, each individual data point at each individual time might predict the next one inside that replication, which is why we don't view a single transit simulation as generating a lot of data. It's effectively generating a single data point. So that's kind of a summary of where we're going here. But for a second here, I want to focus on the confidence interval and why it is useful. Okay, so um, are there any questions about any of the terminology here or just in general? Anything I need to slow down on. Okay. So, um, all right, so yeah, this useful estimator of the mean stuff. So, if we look at this confidence interval, so I, I use this notation up here. Um, so this, sometimes people are confused, but this is just me saying that whatever percentage I give you here, like so let's say it's a 95% confidence interval, all I'm saying here is you can figure out the significance level by subtracting out um, whatever that percentile is from 100. So a 95% confidence interval corresponds to a significance level of 5%. And so this is all I'm saying here. If I were to put in uh, 0.05 into here, then I would get 0.95 in here, and multiply that by 100. That gives me my 95 percentile confidence interval. And so uh, this is the formula for the confidence interval. So why is this a useful interval? Well, what I've done here is I've built a um, little example in Excel. And so um, if we look across here, then uh, what I've, uh, it, it might be hard to see here, but I've, um, I've set up a, a mean of five and a standard deviation of 0.1 on a hypothetical normal distribution. So I'm saying I've got a population that, you know, my real world is a normal distribution with a mean of five and a standard deviation of 0.1. So what I've gone he through here is that I've drew, drawn, I don't know what these, I think there's like 13 samples here. And I've used the inverse transform method inside Excel to draw 13 samples of a normal distribution. So um, I draw a uniform random variable from a random number from zero to one, and I put it into the inverse um, uh, CDF for a normal distribution with this mean and this standard deviation, and that generates samples here. So each row of this you can view as samples from a real world system whose real mean is five and real standard deviation is 0.1. All right, and so then what I've done over here is that I've gone and I've actually taken the sample mean for that row and the sample standard deviation for that row. And then I've also calculated the 95 percentile uh, confidence interval um, half width 
And so that's what we see calculated over here. And I can do that for multiple rows. And so um, if I do that over and over again, so this is, I'm just um, saying this out or, or just writing out what I just said. So on this side of the slide, I do the inverse transform technique to sample from a normal distribution. And I generate, I don't know what, like 13 or so of these variables. And then in these columns, I calculate the sample mean and the sampled standard deviation for all of those data. And I also calculate the 95 percentile half width based on that um, that sample standard deviation. And then in this column over here, I am going to count whether the confidence interval includes the true mean of five. And so if I take this mean, which in this bottom one here is 5.01 and it's half width of 0.03, then I can say does 5.01 plus or minus 0.03 include the real mean of five. And you can see in these first two, it's true. So that's what I'm just saying down here is in this column, I am just counting whether I've managed to capture the true mean in the confidence interval. And I'm gonna do a lot of that. So I generate a bunch of those, and I'm sorry, there were 18 samples here, so not 13. Um, and uh, so there's a question here. Um, if the random uh, numbers are generated from a system with a known mean and a known standard deviation, why do we use a t-test? Shouldn't we use a z-test? It's a good question. What I'm saying here is I let's imagine that I did not know the real mean of five. I'm just saying that um, as a baseline, I'm going to generate a hypothetical system that has a true distribution that I know for ground truth just to test out the efficiency of a confidence interval. Now, in the real world, you wouldn't know the true mean. You would just have these samples, and you would only run one of these experiments. You'd get 18 data points. And then from these 18 data points, you would then report to your boss what your estimate of the true mean was. So in this case, I know the true mean, and I can evaluate how good a confidence interval is at capturing the true mean. But in a real world case, you don't know the true mean. All you have are these 18 samples. And so that's what we're trying to validate the use of a confidence interval. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, that does. Sorry. I was trying to get my Great. mic. That does make sense. No problem. Thanks. All right. So I've then grabbed, I forget how many of these I generated. You know, let's say 100 or something like that. I've, uh, it looks like I've generated 187 of these confidence intervals. So of these 187 confidence intervals, each one of them were generated from a different set of 18 samples. Those 18 samples all were drawn from the same population that has an average of five or mean of five and a standard deviation of 0.1. So I drew all of these things here and I can then see how many of these actually include the true mean. And so I can see that this first confidence interval, which I've highlighted in blue, includes the mean, which is depicted down here as this vertical bar which is centered around its average of 4.96, but you can see its error bars, which include the 95% confidence interval, they extend up to include the true mean. And you can see most of these include the true mean. They capture the true mean. But there are one, two, three, four, five, six out of the 187 that I generated that do not include the true mean. So that is roughly 5% of the population of confidence intervals do not include the true uh, mean. In other words, if I were to ask, are these data different from a hypothetical mean of five? In five or in six of these 170, 87 experiments, the confidence interval would tell me that um, falsely that the hypothetical mean of five was was different from the data. It would detect a difference from the null hypothesis of five. But in all of the others, in the 181 others, then that mean of five would not be rejected. So that is our interpretation, is that the confidence interval are all the hypotheses that would not be rejected, which also corresponds to saying that if you were to run your experiment 100 times, then alpha fraction of them will not include the true mean, but one minus alpha fraction of them will include the true mean. That's what we're seeing here. 
And so what that means, I can do a couple of other experiments to test how these confidence intervals work. And so what I've done here is um, I have uh, generated, um, so this is 100, I generated 100 confidence intervals here, 100 confidence intervals here, 100 confidence intervals here. So this is 300 confidence intervals, but I now have adjusted my alpha to be very low. So my false positive rate, my type one error rate is 0.001, extremely low, which means these confidence intervals are 99.9% .9 confidence intervals. So, in or so what that means is that now 99.9% .9 of my confidence intervals will include the mean. Well, how does that happen? How do I make a confidence interval more likely to include the mean? Well, I make it larger. So the lower you make the false positive rate, so if I have a low false positive rate, I'm going to make larger confidence intervals. And that will make confidence intervals that pretty much always are going to cross the real mean. Now they're not as useful because they're larger. They don't reject as many hypotheses. So they're not as precise, they're not as sensitive, but they do at least guarantee you that you're not going to reject the true mean. Okay, so what other things can I do? Well, if I then increase my alpha to 0.05, where it normally, where I normally do it, then in the 0.05 case here, so this is my false positive 0.05, again, 100 confidence intervals, 100 confidence intervals, 100 confidence intervals. And then now I can see here that roughly five out of every 100 confidence intervals reject the true mean. So the true mean is five and 95 out of the 100 confidence intervals on average um, include the true mean of five. It's only the rare case, the 5% case where I get a confidence interval like these that are so far away that they um, falsely reject the true mean. So you can see that I've done that experiment three times here. All right, so then um, if I want to get a very high false positive rate, so in this case, I had a false positive rate of 60%. So this gives me 40% confidence intervals. So 40% confidence intervals mean that I have very little confidence that I'm going to grab the true mean. And so you can see that um, all these ones that are dotted in this kind of little uh, pinkish dot here, these are the ones that miss the true mean. And I get roughly 60% um, of them miss the true mean. They're extremely narrow. So it looks like you actually have a lot of confidence in your estimate. But the, the irony is um, the, the narrowness of the confidence interval actually reflects less confidence, not more confidence. And that's why we refer to them as a 40% confidence interval. So a 0% confidence interval would be a single point. A 100% confidence interval would be the entire real line. The only way you can be 100% confident you've got the real mean is if you make your confidence interval every number. The only way you can be 0% uh, com uh, uh, confident that you've got the real mean is if you actually give someone a point estimate. So if you give someone a point estimate, you're sounding extremely confident, but you're actually giving them the least confident of your estimates, because a point estimate is effectively a 0% confidence interval. Okay. Um, so what can you do to reduce your confidence intervals without reducing your confidence? And, uh, and so, uh, so what you can do there is you can gather more samples. So the more samples you get, the narrower your confidence intervals will get for the same false positive rate. So now what I've done here is I've taken 100 confidence intervals, but here I've done it across 20 samples, here across 200 samples, and here across 2,000 samples, all with the same false positive rate of 0.05. And what you can see here is that the confidence intervals get narrower and narrower. But regardless of how narrow they are, then I still only end up falsely rejecting about 5% uh, of, um, of the, only about 5% of the confidence intervals, five out of every 100, end up falsely rejecting the true mean of five. So we can see here that if I gather 2,000 samples, I can get extremely sensitive, so extremely narrow confidence intervals, and yet still only have a 5% error rate. So that is the power of statistical power of gathering more samples. The other thing that affects confidence interval width is variance. 
And so what I've done here is I have been um, generated 100 confidence intervals with um, different variances. So I now have a population with a standard deviation of 0.5, a population with a standard, standard deviation of 1, and a population with a standard deviation of 2. And I have the same false positive rate in all three of these cases. So I have a 95% confidence interval in all three of these cases. But as the standard deviation in my population gets bigger, then so do the confidence intervals. Now the confidence intervals still have a 5% error rate. Only five out of every hundred of them miss the true mean. But because the variance has increased, then the confidence intervals have increased as well. So noisier data, in order to have the same level of confidence with noisier data, you have to have wider confidence intervals. So that's an intuition you should build about these confidence intervals. Okay. So any questions about that? Is this experiment clear, what I've done here? Note that you would not run an experiment 100 times and generate 100 confidence intervals. If you had the budget to run an experiment 100 times, you would just run one experiment that's 100 times as long. And then you would get you know, really narrow confidence intervals. But the point I'm trying to make here is if you only have the budget to run one experiment, you don't have the budget to run 100 experiments, then the 95% confidence interval is going to tell you how likely is it that you were unlucky enough to run an experiment that was an outlier. And the 95% confidence interval says that 5% of the time your experiment will end up being an outlier and totally not represent the true mean. But 95% of the time, your single experiment will include the true mean if you use a 95% confidence interval. So are there questions about that? Okay. All right, so um, where does the confidence interval come from? So just uh, if we think about our t-test example, then this is the condition to not reject a hypothesis in the t-test. So t-test, we've got a hypothesis of uh, mu. So that's a hypothesis that um, we're saying here that we're testing, we have these data that we've taken samples from, we've generated this sample mean, and we are not sure, but we would like to test whether the true population has this mean down here, this mean mu down here. And if we find that our sample mean and our hypothetical mean are not that far apart, so they're within this uh, T critical value, uh, then we say that we do not reject the hypothesis of mu. Now, if I <clears throat> take this absolute value and unpack it into the cases where the sample mean is less than mu or greater than mu, then I actually get an idea of where the confidence interval comes from. So in the case where my sample mean happens to be greater than my hypothetical mean, then the absolute value is just a subtraction. And so if I take this condition, but get rid of the absolute value signs, I have uh, this condition over here. So with a little uh, a rearrangement, then I find that my sample mean here is sandwiched between um, this, the, or rather they find that the hypothetical mean is sandwiched between the sample mean and the sample mean minus this quantity here, which happens to be the half width of our confidence interval. Likewise, if I assume the case where the sample mean that I gathered is less than the hypothetical mean, then this absolute value here is just basically negative what's inside it. So I flip the order of those two things. So this condition here is equivalent to this condition over here. With a little uh, uh, rearrangement, then I see that the hypothetical mean is sandwiched in between the sample mean and this sample mean plus the half width that I solved for here. So what we see here is that the 95% confidence interval is just the, the conditions for not rejecting a hypothesis of the t-test all just made compact into an interval. So the probability that a hypothesis is in the confidence interval is um, the probability that the true hypothesis is in the confidence interval under the condition. So if we assume that this hypothesis is true, 
the probability that the true hypothesis is in our generated confidence interval is one minus alpha, where alpha is a significance level. So for a significance level of 5%, then we get a 95% probability that the true mean is within this interval. So it is just a, it, it's just an interval representation of a t-test, all of the hypotheses that could not be rejected by a t-test. So the simple one sample rule is that if your confidence interval does not include the hypothetical mean that you're interested in, you can reject that hypothetical mean with the level of significance of alpha, which is basically one minus the confidence level. So, or 100 minus the confidence level, depending on if you're in percent or not. And so if someone shows you a confidence interval, you don't need to run a one sample t-test. They've effectively done all of the one sample t-tests for you. If the hypothetical example, if you're wondering, hmm, I wonder if this system has an average performance of three customers per minute or an average, yeah, performance of three customers per minute. If they give you a confidence interval that goes from one to two, so it doesn't include three, then you know that three is likely not represented in the data. But if they instead gave you a confidence interval from two to four, then that means that your three, your hypothetical three might be represented in the data. You don't have to do a t-test. It's been done for you by, by them giving you the confidence interval. For the two sample case, so in that case, if they give you two confidence intervals, so system A, system B, and you're wondering, are system A and system B equivalent in performance? If those two confidence intervals do not overlap, so if they give you a confidence interval for system A, which is down here, and a confidence interval for system B, which is up here, so this confidence interval down here and this confidence interval up here have daylight in between them, if there is a difference between those two confidence intervals, then you can say that a two sample t-test would generate the result that these two systems are significantly different in mean. If they do overlap, so this confidence interval happens to overlap with this confidence interval. So if this confidence interval is here and this confidence interval is here and they overlap, an overlapping confidence interval basically means that you can't do anything with the confidence intervals. You actually have to run the two sample uh, test instead. Now, they could give you a standard error of the mean just because sometimes people like to summarize their data with SEMs instead. So if they give you a standard error of the mean and you are pretty confident that it's normally distributed data, if you want the confidence interval, then for a 95% confidence interval, you just double the standard error of the mean and that will give you the half width that you get for a confidence interval. So um, I've seen showed you an example of this last time. I can give you uh, by an as is, is system. This is like the control system. And maybe this is a performance variable for the control system. And then I can give you a system where I've made an intervention. I've changed the way the burritos are made. And uh, my simulation comes out. And in my as is system, it gives me this standard error, the mean. So mean plus or minus this standard error, the mean. And in my uh, treatment system, in my system where I've done it a different way, it gives me this average performance plus or minus this standard error of the mean. Now, initially, when I look at these standard error of the means, it looks like my um, modified simulation is going to actually do better, have a higher performance and be you know, lower in uh, processing time, something like that, than, uh, than the as is group. But if we remember the confidence intervals, are double the standard error of the mean. And if I double the standard error of the mean so that I extend the confidence interval up and down, then what I find is that the 95% confidence interval that I get from doubling the standard error of the mean ends up overlapping. And because there's overlap there, then I actually cannot conclude anything without actually doing a formal two sample t-test, which the output analyzer can do for you. Now, if these were confidence intervals and not standard error of the mean, and they didn't overlap like this, so there's no overlap in between them, then I don't need to do a two sample t-test. I can conclude immediately that these two systems are, um, are significantly different from each other at the 5% error rate. Okay. So um, 
Yeah, so are there questions about that before I move in on any further? No questions? Be clear. Okay. All right, and then I mentioned before that if I give you a confidence interval, um, then you can be confident that it's normally distributed unless I specify it's a different type of confidence interval, in which case you can actually back out from the confidence interval, the mean, the sample mean of the data, as well as the sample standard deviation. And with the sample mean and sample standard deviation, then uh, you can actually regenerate a CDF for the entire distribution. So you basically can take any data that you've got and you subtract off the sample mean, divide by the standard deviation. We call this you know, a, a standard score. So if you standardize the data by dividing the, by subtracting the mean and dividing by standard deviation, if you plug that into the CDF for a standard normal, the resulting composition here will be a estimated CDF for your data. So if you need a CDF for your data, so you're doing an inverse transform technique or something like that, or you just generally want uh, to summarize your data with a CDF, if you know the mean and standard deviation and you know it's normal, then you can generate that. And so this is a quick way to generate a CDF from the data. And you can back out all of this information just from the confidence interval, because the confidence interval gives you the mean and it implicitly gives you the standard deviation so long as you know how many replications went in to calculate in that interval. All right, any questions about that? Let's see. Okay. So just a couple more questions and then we'll do an attendance exercise and then get into some kind of more new stuff in the rest of this lecture, which is like actually a short lecture after that. All right, so um, there are a couple other intervals that I want to emphasize. So I didn't talk about this one yet, but the prediction interval. This is different than the confidence interval. Um, we won't use it that much, but you should know that it exists and you should be well aware of the difference between it and the confidence interval. So the prediction interval, so I still take a mean of, a, so I've sampled a bunch of data, I ran some experiments and I got in samples of data as we see up here, and I calculate them a, um, I calculate then a point estimate of those in samples of data. And so a confidence interval would tell me how confident am I that this sample mean is close to the real mean. A prediction interval is more of an estimate of how confident am I that future samples are going to be close to this sample mean. So the prediction interval is actually more of an estimator of the variance of the distribution and not the mean of the distribution. So the prediction interval is down here. It looks similar to the confidence interval, but instead of using the standard error of the mean, we use this formula here where we take the standard deviation and we multiply it by the square root of one plus one over n. And the important thing to note here is that as n goes to infinity, then this half width here does not disappear. This half width, as n goes to infinity, this uh, part of the half width just goes to the standard deviation, just goes to the sample standard deviation. So what the prediction interval is giving you is it is giving you an estimate of the true mean of the population plus sort of a um, it's sort of a z-score value. So it's giving you an estimate of the true mean of the population plus an estimate of the population's true kind of standard deviation plus some noise having to do the fact that you've only taken a finite number of samples. And so this right here is the con contribution to variance due to the sampling process. And this right here is the contribution to variance due to the fact that the system is just variable. The system has intrinsic variance. So this prediction interval here is an estimate of uh, this prediction interval for, this is kind of the ideal prediction interval here, which is basically saying that 95 out of 100 prediction intervals will capture the next 
sample that you get from your data. So you're not trying to capture the true mean, you're trying to capture basically 95% of the data. So if you think about it here, this interval for a, a normal distribution, this interval would basically capture 95% of the normal distribution under it, because this is the mean of the normal distribution. And with the z-score here, that z-score kind of allows you to capture the two-tailed area to the left and the right of the mean to capture 95% of the data under it. And that's what this is trying to capture. But because it's, it's using a t statistic and it's using this one over square root of n to deal with the fact that you've not taken thousands of samples, you've taken tens of samples. And so the sampling is going to add additional variance that goes above and beyond the variance that is fundamental to your system. And so this is a, a kind of low sample number generalization of this interval right here. So the prediction interval is about variance and it estimates the data left to gather, whereas the confidence interval is about the mean and it estimates, um, you know, and it's estimated from the data gathered. So some people like to say, and the book uses this terminology, that the confidence interval is a measure of error and the prediction interval is a measure of risk. And so I want you to know those two terms because the book makes a big deal of them. And so I want you to know those two. So any questions about that? Is it clear the difference between the prediction interval and the confidence interval? Okay. All right, and then we mentioned quantiles last time. You can do quantile estimation, and then you can also do interval estimates around quantiles. And so the half width for quantile estimation is this ugly thing. And I got a great question last time about why is the quantile being estimated? Why does it show up in the half width? And so if I'm asking for the P quantile here, it turns out that, um, that you know if I've got a, a set of data the, it, you have to sort of ask them, what is the variance in a quantile estimate? You know, it's hard to figure that out. And it turns out that that's tied to the actual quantile that you're trying to estimate. And so this P times one minus P is effectively the variance in any given quantile. So if I need to estimate the 100% quantile, well, I have a lot of confidence that I just take the largest data point that I've sampled. And it's possible that there is um, a data point that I haven't sampled that is larger. But if I have a lot of data, then most likely um, the largest data point in my sample is a good proxy for the largest uh, data that I could sample. And then likewise, it goes for the small one. So if I'm estimating the zeroth quantile, so the largest data point would be the 100% or 100 percentile or uh, the one quantile. Um, if I'm estimating the zero quantile or the zero percentile, then I just take the minimum point in my data. And I'm pretty confident that there's not going to be, uh, that there's not a lot of estimation error. There's not a lot of variance in that estimate. Now, if I want to estimate the 50th percentile, I would take the median of my data. But I'm pretty confident that if I gather additional data, that median is going to change. And additional data, that median is going to change. And so there's going to be a lot of intrinsic sampling variance that'll be more around p equals 0.5 than p equals 1 or p equals 0. And so that's the reason why in place of the standard deviation in this half width, you get p times 1 minus p. And we sort of assume that we gather enough data points to uh, make some normal, uh, um, some normal assum assumptions, some continuity assumptions. I'm not going to go into that, but it relates to a similar, uh, if you go back to our description of how the chi-squared test works, there's some similar stuff going on here with how this confidence in our world was built. And I leave that as an exercise for you to kind of study that if you're interested in it. But knowing this um, kind of half width, then it allows you to figure out the ranks for which data to, to put at your low end of your confidence interval and your high end of your confidence interval. So you sort all of your data. And after you sort all of your data, then you know that the midpoint of your confidence interval is going to be the data at rank 
P times the number of data points. And so in this case, the number of data points are R. And so if I want to figure out which data point to put on the left hand side, I subtract from P this half width. And that gives me a new P, PL, which I multiply by my number of data points. And that gives me the rank of which data point to use on the left end of that confidence interval. And then the symmetric case for the right end of that confidence interval. So that's how I generate confidence intervals for quantile estimates. And so again, whenever you can do a, um, a point estimate, try to look up how to do the interval estimate because the interval estimate is always better than the point estimate. All right, and then the last thing that we talked about last time is we said, all right, for terminating systems, which are simulated with transient simulations, then how many replications do we run? That's the key question to ask when you have a transient simulation. You're not the length of the simulation, not how much data to discard, how many of these things do I run? And so before um, we got to here, we talked about power analysis. And that's kind of what you did in that homework, that recent homework G3. And so that power analysis, which I think I extended so that it was due today, if I remember correctly. So that power analysis, that's kind of the traditional old school statistical way to do it. The alternative way to do it is someone could say, I want you to gather enough data to ensure my confidence interval is no wider than a particular width. And so you can give specifications on width either in absolute case, I'd want it to be no larger than two, or in a percentage of mean. I want it to be no larger than 5% of the mean. And then with that, you can use that with a formula like this one, where you can put in the desired width, which is this epsilon here, into the half width formula, and then solve for the number of replications. And if you've already done a pilot study to give you an estimate of the variance in the data, then this gives you a threshold where you can figure out I need to gather at least this many samples for my half width to be shrunk to that size. And to make things simpler, we often just um, simplify this expression using um, a standard Z instead. And so um, uh, this formula right here, you can easily plug in your pilot variance that you gathered from your pilot study and then this uh, critical Z value corresponding to your half width. And then that whole thing is scaled by your desired half width. And then that whole thing is squared. And that gives you the number of replications you need to achieve that half width. Now you've already run R not replications to generate your pilot data. So you can just generate a few more to add to it. And then hopefully that will bring your half width to, a, to the right size. It may be that it's still not quite right because it might be that your estimate of the variance was a little bit off in your pilot study. But this at least is a good heuristic to try to uh, figure out how many, uh, uh, roughly how many more samples you're going to need to gather to get your half width down. And of course, you want to reduce the number of replications as much as possible because replications take time. So you can't run as many of them as you like. You want to run as few as possible. Okay, so that brings us up to date. So are there any questions about any of that? A lot of that you got a chance to practice with on lab nine. Okay. So in that case, um, here's the first attendance question. So um, I'll put the URL in the chat. It's also up there on the screen and you can see the question, which is for if I take five samples that happen to be normally distributed data, which of the options below has the largest confidence interval on the mean of those samples? And so is it the 1% confidence interval, the 10%, the 85%, the 95%, the 99%, or is there not enough information and it depends on the data you gather? So go ahead and fill in your uh, attendance question response. Don't hit submit, just put it in on the form as usual. And, um, and then uh, if you're interested in, well, I mean, maybe put it in the chat like we do, but don't hit enter. Um, so give everybody a chance to choose one. So which confidence interval is largest? So is it the 1% confidence interval that's largest or is it the 99% confidence interval that's largest? Or do you need to know more about the data in order to make that decision? 
So it's kind of a hint that it can't be B, C, or D, right? Because it, it's kind of a continuous thing. So it's pretty much, is it just the 1% or the 99% or do you not know enough? So um, go ahead and those who are brave enough, can you put into the chat what you think your answer is? All right, I'm seeing some answers come in. So far, it looks like across the board, everyone is saying 99%. And that is also what I would say, the 99% confidence interval. So to have near 100% confidence, the only way you can get that is by making a gigantic interval to capture all possible means. So a 99% confidence interval is equivalent to an alpha of 0.01. The lower you make your alpha, the lower you make your type one error, you basically stop rejecting. So an 100% confidence interval covers the real line and doesn't reject any hypotheses. So the large confidence interval means low rejections. So, um, so that's what, um, so that's where that 99 percentile comes from. Low rejections is high confidence. Okay. All right, so uh, to wrap up here. So now we uh, moved on to steady state simulation. So are there any questions about that? Does that make sense to everybody why the 99% confidence interval is the largest confidence interval? All okay. All right, so in lab nine, you dealt with both transient simulations and steady state simulations. And so you should have some experience with this. And so the uh, idea here is that we're in a transient simulation, which means that our simulation has a warm up period, but that what we're trying to simulate, uh, I'm sorry, we're not in a transient, we're in a steady state simulation. We're trying to simulate the long run behavior of our system. So we're trying to simulate um, the steady state level of the system. And so we are, throwing out the transient. So we're getting rid of this warm up period. So our simulation must have a warm up period because you have to hit start. It needs time to, to get adjusted and to, to, to finally come to steady state. But then once it's in steady state, then we can start gathering data. So we want to not gather data from this part and we only want to gather data from this part. If we gather too much data from the early part, we will bias our estimates of the long run behavior. So we want to only simulate the steady state, not the transient. And um, if we end up bleeding in some of the transient into the steady state, then we will bias our performance estimate. And that's what this is showing here. The estimated steady state is too low here. We actually wanted it to be like here, not here. So that we can see we would bias there. So um, the questions which you started to investigate in lab nine was, Warm up period. So we can make this warm up period. How big do we make this warm up period? Um, so basically, how much data do we throw away? How much data do we truncate? And uh, and we, as you've seen in Lab Nine, you can easily truncate data in the run setup in Arena. Um, or uh, the other question we have: Do we generate more replicates, or do we run our simulations for longer? And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today is this question of more replicates, longer execution time, and how much uh, can we batch to reduce these warm up costs. So um, let's just hop into that. So for um, steady state performance measures, the ideal case is we're basically taking limits. And so we're taking the limit of the system as it behaves um, as time goes to infinity. So for discrete time data, so where you're clocking along and you're taking, you know, what is the, um, you know, this customer's uh, wait time, this customer's wait time, this customer's wait time, this customer's wait time, and so on. For that type of data, then, uh, then we are just taking an arithmetic mean where you're dividing by infinity. And so you're seeing what this thing is uh, as it goes to infinity. For continuous time data, which is uh, more like uh, how long is the queue now? How long is the queue now? How long is the queue now? Then we're taking an average underneath those curves and we're scaling that average effectively by infinity. And so the limits of these things ends up giving me these steady state performance values. Now, um, the, for our simulation though, we need to get rid of some of the early data and we can't run the thing for infinity. And so for our simulated data, 
for the discrete time case, we've got some level, some D data that we dis, um, up until D we discard. And then we run the simulation up until in, uh, you know, in samples of this simulation, if we're taking customers or whatever. So we might discard the first D customers, uh, but then we end up then taking up to in customers. And so the question is how many total customers and then how many customers do we discard for this to be a good estimate of the mean or of the kind of long term, the limiting case as n goes to infinity. Because that's really what we want to do. If we could let n go to infinity, these early ones would end up being washed out by the infiniteness of the rest of them. But we can't let n go to infinity, so we need to delete some of these early ones in order for this n to be large enough to approximate infinity. Same thing with continuous time data. It's how long do we run the simulation and how much do we get rid of the front in order to guarantee that this estimate is a good estimate for the limit as time goes to infinity. That's what we're doing here. Um, so the, the goal here is to choose these values to reduce our bias, to achieve precision of the estimator, and to do it um, without uh, leading to simulations that run for months. So we you know, need to respect our computation time constraints. So um, I already covered the kind of steady state uh, measures here and our strategy to keep only a certain amount of data. Uh, so one solution to this, to get rid of this warm-up period or to make this warm-up period short, is to do intelligent initialization. And so what we mean by intelligent initialization is that rather than initializing the system down here, we would like to initialize our system more closer to up here. So there might still be a little bit of a transient, but you end up getting the steady state behavior sooner because the transient doesn't have to deal with this giant displacement from its eventual steady state behavior. So intelligent initialization is a common way that we can do to do this. So if we can, try to choose smart initial values. Now, what do we mean by smart initial values? So in an inventory system, don't just set your inventory is equal to zero because it's numerically convenient. Try to think about what is the steady state inventory level? Amazon doesn't ever have an empty warehouse. So try to figure out that, you know, from data, what normally is in an Amazon warehouse, or not even normally, just right now, this instant, what's in the Amazon warehouse, and use that as your initial inventory levels. Um, don't put zero customers uh, in the queue at the start of a simulation. Say, on average, how many customers do we see in the data that are in the queue? Six. All right, then I'm going to start the simulation with six customers in the queue. Um, you know, likewise with a reliability simulation, um, don't assume that everything is fresh and new in the beginning of your reliability simulation. Maybe start with a couple of components that have already failed. And so uh, that makes it much more realistic so that um, it, it ends up becoming much more like a real system. So how do you choose these initial conditions? I already mentioned some data-based uh, ideas, collect data from a real system. The other thing you can do is actually make use of things like 470. Generally, the approaches in 470 are kind of cute back the envelope approaches we do to we get to sort of think about queuing models. But in reality, they probably don't have a whole lot of realism. They give us some basic design ideas for these queuing systems, but we probably end up having to do a lot more study uh, in order to actually make use, uh, actually to implement these real queuing systems. Now, what you can do with the kind of overly simplistic mathematical models from 470 is use them to generate expected steady state values. So generate a simpler queuing model of your simulation system, see what its steady state value is, and then set the initial conditions for your simulation based on your 470 model. It probably still won't get rid of all the transients, but you'll get you a lot closer. Okay, so that's what we mean by intelligent initialization. The um, other data, the other thing we can do, which we're probably end up going to have to do anyway, is that we'll still have to discard some of that transient data. And so the question is, how do we choose the transient data? Before I go on to that, are there any questions about intelligent initialization? Is it pretty clear what I mean? by choosing initial conditions that are more realistic, not just zero. Uh, 
And if you go back to thinking of the inventory model that we did a while back, the Bucky's inventory model that you'll revive, you see again in the next homework. Um, if you remember, there was a state variable which represented how much you have in inventory of that product. And you could set it to zero and then you would get a huge ordering period and a lag time at the beginning, which would be totally unrealistic. So instead, you can just set the inventory level to a more realistic inventory. And so that's kind of what I'm talking about doing. Take that state variable, don't set it to zero, set it to 60, set it to 55, and then start the simulation from there. And then hopefully it'll reduce how much data you have to throw out in that inventory simulation. Okay. All right, so um, how to choose this T naught, uh, this initial uh, period here. So um, this is not exactly a science. Um, it's not quite an art, but it's somewhere between art and science. So one thing you can do here, it, a lot of this will be like these heuristics that you'll use. So you'll use your best judgment. So like in lab nine, you can plot the, your, your simulation output. So this is some performance variable from your simulation output. And as you plot it, you might be able to spot the transients. And so down here, we can kind of see that the system started down here and there's a quick jump up. So that's definitely transient. And then um, it, this, there's this like rise. And so I might initially think this is all transients and I want to just get rid. So from my pilot data, it sort of suggests that maybe all of this data up here is a warm up period and I should get rid of anything before this time point right here. And that looks like that might be an okay strategy, but then if I keep looking down here, I see that things start coming down where it almost looks like the steady state is down here. So if I would have run my pilot data a little bit farther, then maybe I actually determined that these, this much larger area, maybe that's actually the transient. So the transient had an overshoot and then this is when it's actually coming back and acting, you know, it's ringing a little bit here. And this is more like the steady state behavior over here. And so, um, so looking at this, you can see that, well, I, you know, I can be conservative and choose uh, the data out here as my good data and get rid of all this data, but maybe there's a, an alternative to do. And so um, the book presents one alternative in this case, and it says just smooth the data out. And so you can take all of the data that you've taken from your one pilot simulation run, and you can basically run um, an average where you plot the data. So the dark line here, I know it might be hard to see, but the dark line with a lot of variability, that's the simulation data directly from the simulation. And the light line, which is a little bit buried in here, has a lot less variance here, that is a cumulative average. And so what they've done is they've just plotted um, at every time point the average of all data before that time point. And that ends up giving you a much smooth trajectory here, which hopefully when there's less variance, it will be clearer to see that maybe there's only um, a transient here and that everything from this point out is the steady state. So that's one way to do it, but I don't get a lot of confidence from that cumulative average method. Now, again, going back to lab nine, another option is I could run a pilot study where I run five independent replications. And so I've got those things here. I've got my five independent replications all plotted on the same axis. And then I can look for patterns here. And I can look then see that in uh, all of them, like in some of them, there's kind of an overshoot and then it kind of levels out. In other ones, there seems to be some sort of kind of undershoot and then maybe it levels out. And so they all kind of cross around this point and you think maybe, maybe this is where the transient period ends. It's kind of hard to tell. But what I can do is I can now average across those independent replications at every time point. This is what your book goes into too. So if I do that, I can actually get a confidence interval at every time point. And so that's what's being plotted here is I've got the dark line is the mean at every time point across those five replications. And the dashed lines are the upper and lower limits of a confidence interval around those. And so what I can see here is that in these data, that the confidence interval kind of settles out at about this point right here, maybe back here even. 
So for these data here, I'm seeing that the mean and the confidence intervals are just rising continuously until they end up leveling out out here. So that kind of tells me that this point right here around, I don't know, 30 seconds or 30 minutes, though that's the point, that's my real data and everything before that are my transients that I want to truncate and get rid of. Um, and then I can also smooth that out as well. And the book kind of talks about that as well. So I can take a moving average um, over these data to get rid of the additional bumps to try to make um, the period between the transients and the non-transients uh, more clear. The downside of the moving average is they blur the edges a little bit. So you end up maybe making too conservative of choices, but they make your course choices a little bit more confident. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to hold questions for a second because I will just want to make sure I get uh, cover a couple other slides here um, before we end to make sure we cover this stuff. Uh, but so the um, so the, so we've just covered how do you figure out um, how many replications and how to well so we figured out how to uh, come up with an intelligent way to initialize a, a steady state simulation. We've come up with a way to figure out how to get rid of transient data in a steady state simulation. And so um, now we have another question of, um, you know, how do we ensure that, or is there a trade-off we can make between the number of replications we have to run and how long we can run our steady state simulation? So really the question I'm getting at here is how much computational time are we gonna throw into this process? And are we going to put it in terms of making each replication longer or are we going to put it into making more replications? So, um, so that's uh, kind of what we're talking about here. And so about the length of each replication, there is a simple rule that the book recommends and I recommend too. And it basically means you run your simulation for at least 10 times the length of your discarded period. So if you have a period of D discarded, then multiply that interval by 10 and make sure you have 10 times that left over in data that you actually want to gather. Something similar, although the, the, this formula is um, you know, a little bit even more simplified here, for continuous uh, performance measures, if you've discarded an interval of length 10 of t0, then we're saying that make the end of your simulation um, no shorter than 10 times that t0. So this is a good heuristic for figuring out how long to make each replication. Now, after that, then how many replications? You wanna run as many independent replications as possible, but generally the benefit to running more replications falls off when you run 25 or more replications. So in order for you to really make a significant difference in shrinking your confidence intervals, you're gonna to need to run not uh, 26 replications, you're going to need to run 250 replications. It's going to be a massive increase. So instead, once you hit 25 replications, then devote more computational time into extending the length of each replication rather than extending the replications themselves. And this is one of the tricks we get that allows us to reduce the variance in each replication. So instead of increasing the number of samples, we're decreasing the variance of replications. So the idea here is that if I end up deciding that I would write, like to run uh, R minus R naught more replications using the formula from the transient simulations, if I use that same formula, decide I wanna run that many more replications, what I can do instead is simply scale the discarded period up by that ratio and scale the, the period that I'm keeping up by that ratio. And so I took my kind of pilot data here and I've scaled the discarded period up and I've scaled the total period up. And so my replication lengths will all be longer and my discarded periods will all be longer. And because I'm discarding more data, then I introduce less risk of bias. And so the, the um, initialization bias is further reduced. So that's, I think, a good place for me to stop. There's only one other topic that I wanted to cover today, batch means, and I will cover that um, next time. So I'm gonna jump, um, jump to this last attendance question here, and I'm happy to take a few questions if people have them. So I put the attendance link 
uh, there in the attendance question up here, uh, which of the following is not affected by an increase in independent simulation replications? Um, the confidence interval, the mean estimator variability, the computational time required, uh, or the estimator bias. And, um, and so I didn't quite hit you over the head with this, but I'm hoping the answer is clear here. And I will tell you for sure that it is not E. So it is one of A, B, C, or D. So, um, and all of the other ones in three of A, B, C, or D, if you increase replications, you can uh, change them. But in the last one, if you increase the replications, just by increasing replications, you're not going to affect it. So go ahead and put your answer in the attendance exercise. And that's all I've got for you today. Um, I'll cover the last thing that we didn't cover next time. And uh, if I'll, I'm happy to take any questions for the last couple of minutes if you have them. If not, then you can feel free to head out. So no questions so far. Uh, there was a question, a private question, will there be a lab section this week? And I, I explained that in the beginning so that uh, because there is, because of Veterans Day, there's no formal lab this week. So there's no lab section on Wednesday this week. Uh, but um, so lab 10, is technically next week. And so you can have all of this week to finish lab nine if you haven't finished it and turn it in uh, Sunday of this week, this upcoming Sunday. And then lab 10 is formally assigned um, next week. But I recommend getting started on lab 10 sooner because lab 10 is a longer lab because there's 20 points extra bonus credit. So it's effectively two labs in one. And if you decide to do the second half of it, you can get a, a decent amount of bonus. And if you need help for Lab 9, um, you can feel free to come to my office hours uh, Thursday at 4 p.m. Uh, you can also um, post uh, if uh, you can post for help on Slack or on the discussion boards. You can send me an email, you can send the TA an email. Um, so those would be good places to get help for Lab 9. All right, any other questions? In that case, I will um, close this room so that I uh, reset for the next class. See you Thursday.